Good morning, everybody. It's about that time. This morning, my brother handed me this pack of Polaroid pictures from my wedding day, which is like 20 years ago next month, which was a good reminder that my anniversary is coming up. So if you want to see a much younger version of myself and a version of my wife that looks exactly the same as she does now, I'll show those to you later on. So last Sunday, I left from here and I went down to, um, to Roseville to pick up donuts because it was Alex's fifth birthday on Monday and he really wanted donuts. So as I was leaving here, I remembered that there's a, a guy that's been, you know, we've been texting back and forth and he lives in Auburn and he was wanting to get together with me. So I thought, hey man, I'm driving through Auburn in a few minutes. You want to get lunch? So we, uh, Went and got lunch, and I, you know, told them, "Look, I'm I'm driving down to get Krispy Kreme donuts, and then I'm gonna do a little shopping in Sam's Club because we need groceries. So that's all I'm doing. If you want to ride along with me, he's like, "Yeah, sure. I'm not doing anything else." So we went down and got donuts, and then we walked through Sam's Club. And I, this is not an advertisement for Sam's Club, okay? But they've got an app, and it's like. You know, when you do the self-checkout thing at the end of the grocery store, it's in, in the app. So as you're walking, walking around and you pick something up off the shelf, you just scan the barcode, put it in your cart, and when you're all done, you just, they've got your cart information, you just say slide to pay, and you're done, and you can just walk out. Yeah, it's cool. No contact with anybody if you don't want to. So we're walking around and talking, and I'm grabbing stuff, scanning it, throwing it in the grocery cart, and then... I slide to pay on my app, and I walk around all of the cashiers, and he gets this look in his face, a little bit confused, and he goes, wait. And then I, can, I process all of this, and just like I'm looking at him, and I realize, oh, he thinks I'm trying to steal all of this stuff. <laughs> and he goes, it took him like a half a second, okay. And he, he just nodded, yeah, all right, we're doing this. And I'm thinking... This is a kid that was in my youth group a long time ago, okay? But he is ready to go to jail with me for like a couple gallons of milk and some bread. Unbelievable. Come on, man. No, I paid for this. It's okay. Gosh. So, I, I mean, I don't know if I should be happy that somehow I've inspired that much loyalty that he's, he's going to do this if, if I ask him to. Or if I should be disappointed that he thought this was a thing that I was into. I don't know. It was funny, though, and I, I've been laughing about it all week. Just, I mean, there's guys that, that will tell you, hey, man, if you ever have to, you know, hide a body, call me. And, I mean, now I know I know. I can call him. Anyway, um, let's see. What do I have to announce this morning? Um... So we've been praying for Jeff Alloways and his mom and their whole family, of course, and she passed away Monday night. And um, Jeff texted me that night and said, hey, my mom finally got to go to heaven. And, uh, you know, man, this fly just really likes my face. He said uh, yesterday, you know, she's been working her whole life to spend Christmas in heaven, and this year she gets to. So... They are persistent little. They are um, celebrating that. They're relieved. She's in complete bliss. So the other thing that's going on with Jeff and Lori is, you guys have probably heard by now because I've heard people talking about it already, is that they have COVID. Um, they wanted me to reassure you guys that they have not been here at all when they had any symptoms. And as far as they know, they didn't get it here. They haven't been in contact with anybody here since um, 
they knew about it. I, I think they said that Jeff first started having symptoms on Saturday, and then Lori later on, um, which, I mean, they haven't been here for two weeks now, so we should all be safe, in my opinion. Um, and they're doing better. He's, he, last night he told me that he felt like they were climbing out of it, so that's good news. Lori didn't really get it as bad as he did, so that's also good news. But we'll be praying for them, and um, I mean, I guess I've got my N95 mask on, so <laughs> I'm still trying to be safe as much as I can. So, uh, let's see, last, yesterday, you guys had the women's conference, and I heard nothing but good things about that, and if you missed that, Lori sent me a link to uh, a YouTube video, which I figured out that I can actually put that right on the front page of the website, so Jan Hagel is on the front page of our website now, and you can just click play and, and listen to her speaking. Sorry, Jan. But uh, you're on Front Street. <laughs> She's in charge of my slides today, so I guess that was a dangerous thing for me to... The last two slides didn't show up? Like the last two... Okay, that's all right. Everyone has their Bible today, right? You're going to need your Bible because the slides... The last couple ones don't... There's some on the back table, so... So, uh, yeah, that was yesterday, and you can watch that on the website if you so choose. Um, we have flyers in the back for the Christmas baskets. They look exactly like the Thanksgiving basket flyers because they are the same Thanksgiving basket flyers. Um, why print two? Because they work. So those on the back, if you're putting together a Christmas basket, grab one of those that give you... Um, an idea of what to put in those baskets. And we still have, I think, five kids' names for the uh, Acres of Hope uh, child sponsorship thing that we're doing for Christmas. So there's still five more names you can grab from the back table. Christmas Gifts of Love, that's what that is. And uh, what else is going on? Christmas Eve service is going to be at 3 p.m., that's on Friday. Christmas is on Saturday, and then church is not going to be here. We're not going to do church on Sunday. Just I'm, Hopefully we say that enough times that people won't show up here on Sunday morning on the day after Christmas, because we won't be here. Um, we have still our, our men's group is still meeting. Um, I, I know that you guys are kind of, you're going to take a break, I think, at some point in December. Um, yeah. Christmas and New Year's off for the men's group. And uh, are you, the women, are you guys taking a break during Christmas? Yes, are. yes, they are. Okay. I kind of assumed with the Christmas brunch that's usually kind of the last thing until you guys start back up again. So stay tuned for when that's going to start back up. And since we have kind of an old list of people to pray for, um, the one person that I know of, besides Jeff and Lori, of course, that we want to be praying for them, is that uh, Bob Walsh went through his surgery last week, uh, and it was successful, but he had some bleeding that was more than they would like to see, so he's still, he's got to stay in bed for a while. So um, that's kind of, uh, I don't know, I would be anxious about that, and that's, I guess, the uh, what they're feeling too. So be praying for them, Jeff and Lori, and all the other folks that we always pray for on Sunday mornings, and of course our servicemen and women who are protecting our freedoms and our first responders. And did I forget anything that I'm supposed to announce? Anybody have any other prayer requests?
and he's doing well now? Good. Okay, good. So for those of you that didn't hear that or for people on the internet, um, Zachary Fink, who's one of the people that we pray for up there, Steve and Susie's grandson, had an appendectomy, but uh, went well, and he's recovering well, so praise God for that. All right, well, let's pray. Lord, we want to lift up Pastor Jeff and Lori, and um, we want to thank you for them. Thank you that, that his mom is at peace, that she is um, worshiping you in heaven, even as we speak. And we want to ask that you would uh, bless them and help them to recover. Pray that they wouldn't get any kind of complications from uh, COVID, that they would rest up well, that they would know that uh, your people love them and that we're lifting them up in prayer and that we'd be, they would be comforted by that. And also that they would just use this time to kind of have a break, um, give them rest through this time, if that's at all possible when they're laid up like that. But uh, just pray that you would bless and comfort them and also want to lift up Bob, uh, our brother Bob. Pray that you would uh, heal his body and help him to recover so he can get back to doing all those things that he loves to do and serving you. And uh, Lord, we want to lift up our servicemen and women, the people that we so much appreciate, the people that keep us safe, ask that you would bless them, especially as Christmas is coming up and they're probably missing their, their homes and their families. Lord, pray that you would give them comfort, that you would be their, their peace and their family, and they, they would celebrate your birth uh, during the season. And so now, Lord, as we come before you when we, we worship you, Lord, we pray that you would help us to have pure hearts and minds, that we would uh, approach your altar with clean hands, and that you would be blessed by our worship of you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Not used to being in charge. <laughs>
lights my heart. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness,
To the cross where your love poured out. 
Lord, we thank you that we can make our way in, into your presence through the blood that you spilled on the cross for us. Thank you that we have access now, that we can sing these praises to you. And Lord, as we look into your word now, Lord, let it be a continuation of our worship of you as we learn about you, as we draw closer to you. And Lord, help us to become more like you as we apply your word to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, this is going to be our uh, second look into the life of Peter. Last week, we began by studying the calling of Peter as Jesus called him to be his disciple. And he started out as Simon, um, just a simple fisherman. And he met Jesus, and Jesus said, I'm going to make you into a fisher of men. And then, of course, he changed his name from Simon to Peter. Peter meant rock. I guess it still means rock in English. And, uh, you know, Jesus kind of began the process of making him, changing him from Simon into the rock that he would eventually make the foundation stone of his church. But Peter's call, or Peter's response to Jesus' call was gradual. He didn't jump right in wholeheartedly with following Jesus the first time that he met him, which was okay. And I think that that's kind of the, the story that a lot of us have of we responded to the call eventually of Jesus, but it didn't happen immediately for us. It took us some time to take on board and process the things that Jesus was telling us, the, the things that we were learning about him. But like Peter, when Peter finally had that moment where he realized, wait, this is for real. Jesus is the Savior, and I need to give my life to him. It says he, he left all, and he followed him. So that was part one. And, and this morning, I guess we're kind of going to do part one of Jesus's disciple, sorry, Peter's discipleship, as he learns to become this man, Peter, that, that, he's, that Jesus is making him into. Uh, I don't know how many parts there gonna, there's going to be to this part of Peter's discipleship. So we're in part one of the discipleship of Peter. There's going to be at least one more part. I don't know. Uh, we'll see how long um, we can stretch that out, I guess. There's a lot of different episodes of Peter's life that I've kind of been interested in exploring, but uh, I don't know if we'll hit all of them. So this morning, as we begin to look at his discipleship, we're going to zoom out a little bit, and we're going to look at more the, well, at least we're going to begin with more of like the general discipleship that Jesus put all of the disciples through, uh, because, you know, we, we know a lot about the individual interactions that Peter had with Jesus, because Peter was a part of writing at least the book of Mark, at least that's what, what people think. So we have a lot more of his individual accounts, but if we kind of only looked at those and we didn't look at the general sort of discipleship that they all had, then we're going to miss a big part of what Peter went through in his life. So we're going to zoom out and look at how Jesus discipled all of his trainees and then at the end, my hope is that we're going to look back at sort of how Peter responded to that. So that's the plan. Um, I kind of looked through the Gospels a lot this week and identified three methods that Jesus used in the discipleship of the disciples. Uh, first of all, he let the disciples watch him work as he ministered to the crowds. They were there for that. And then he also gave the disciples a lot of personal one-on-one -on -one time, private, you know, quiet, away from the crowds. And then he gave them a role. He made them a part of what he was doing. So th those are the three aspects of Jesus' discipleship that we're going to look at this morning. So first of all, he let them watch him work. And it, I did something this week, like I said, I looked through the Gospels, all of them, to identify these things. And one thing that, that I have never done before, but I did a lot this week, was I looked at where Jesus first called the disciples. And we kind of examined that last week with Peter especially. 
And then I looked at what happened directly after Jesus called his disciples. What the first kind of things that they experienced as they were following Jesus around. And we have a lot of Bible verses to read this morning. In fact, we're going to go through the Gospels a lot. But they experienced a lot of wild stuff right off the bat as they followed Jesus around. So as you read these things, um, try to put yourself in their shoes, I guess, as, you know, kind of a wet behind the ears, didn't really know necessarily what was going on with Jesus. Maybe they were still questioning what they were doing with Jesus. And, and just think about what it would be like to be there with Jesus as they experienced these things. So, first of all, we're going to look at the book of Mark, starting in verse 21. It says, And they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and was teaching. And they were astonished at his teachings, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. And immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit convulsed him, and crying out with a loud voice, came out of him. And then look over at the book of Luke, chapter 5. It says, On one of those days, as he was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was with him to heal. And behold, some men were bringing on a bed a man who was paralyzed, and they were seeking to bring him in and lay him before Jesus. But finding no way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and let him down with his bed through the tiles into the midst before Jesus. And when he saw their faith, he said, Man, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to question him, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? When Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered them, who, Why do you question in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, Rise and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, Rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And immediately he rose up before them and picked up his bed. He picked up what he had been lying on and went home, glorifying God. And amazement seized them all, and they glorified God and were filled with awe, saying, We have seen extraordinary things today. And then Matthew kind of summarizes it in Matthew chapter 4, verses 23 through 25. It says, And he went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So as fame spread throughout all Syria, and they brought him all the sick, whose, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, those having seizures and paralytics, and he healed them. And great crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis, and from Jerusalem and Judea, and from beyond the Jordan. So there's a lot of crazy stuff going on around Jesus, and it was, like I said, this was all pretty much immediately after the disciples were first called. In fact, in the book of John, you know, we read about how Andrew brought his brother, then still Simon, to meet Jesus. And that's when Jesus said, I'm going to call you Peter from now on. And then it says in the book of John, later on in chapter 1, the next day he called Philip and Nathaniel, and they became his disciples as well. And then when you start chapter 2 of the book of John, it says, and on the third day, so like two days after, Peter met Jesus for the first time, they went to this wedding. Jesus was invited to the wedding with the disciples. The disciples were there. And that's where Jesus performed his first miracle of changing the water into wine. And they were there for that. In John chapter 2, verse 11, it says, This is the first of the signs Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed on him. So they saw the things that Jesus was doing. And this was kind of like shadowing, right? That I have a friend who just got a, a brand new job, and his training right now consists of basically just watching other people do the job that he's going to be doing. He's shadowing. So that's the kind of things that the disciples saw as they followed Jesus. But they also heard the teachings that he gave to the crowd, right? Immediately after that summary in Matthew chapter 4 about all the crowds coming to him, 
um, Jesus launched into the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, all of it, Matthew chapter 6, all of it, all of Matthew chapter 7, a long sort of manifesto of all the things that Jesus was going to teach, what he expected out of people. The disciples sat there and listened to all of that. They heard all of that. They processed all of that. And of course, all the parables that Jesus taught, you know, the there was times where Jesus is walking along, there's huge crowds following him, and he turns around and he tells them the parable of the sower. Or he turns around and he tells them the, the parable of the farmer who enemy came in and, and sowed weeds in his field, and then he just turned around and kept going. And the disciples were present for all of that because Jesus wanted them not only to hear his teaching and learn the things that, that he was teaching everybody, but also so that they could see how it was done. They were you know, shadowing Jesus. They were going to be doing the same thing um, eventually. They needed to see how Jesus did it. So the next thing, the next method that Jesus used is that he made sure that they had a, ta- a chance to kind of see behind the curtain. So there was all the craziness of the crowds. There was times where Jesus was walking around and people couldn't even get to him. Or like we read in... Um, Luke last week about the crowds that were pressing in so much that he got into the boat to preach from the boat. So that happened a lot, but they also had a lot of times where it was just them and Jesus, where they got to to see what Jesus was like when he was alone with them. Or when, you know, they got to ask him questions. So we talked about the parables, how they would just spout this stuff, parable that, you know, you read through the parables, sometimes they don't make a lot of sense unless you really stop and you seek the truth about what's going on there. And they got to do that in the book of Matthew, chapter 13, verse 36. It says, Then he left the crowds and went into the house, and his disciples came to him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds and the field. And I'm not going to get into the explanation that Jesus made about all the parables, but I I have a feeling that a lot of us wouldn't get the parables at all if we didn't have these episodes where the, the disciples came to Jesus and said, Hey, will you please explain this to us? It doesn't make sense. So they got to ask him questions. And that's almost one of those, to me, chicken and the egg things, which came first. Did they get to ask Jesus questions about what his parables meant because they were his disciples? Or were they his disciples because they were the kind of men who were going to ask questions? And I kind of think it's the latter. You know, they, they were the ones who pursued the truth. They didn't just let it lie. They wanted to know what was going on. So Jesus made sure that they had that chance. And they also saw not only the miracles where it was a big crowd and there's tons of people, but when it was just a private thing, when there was just one or two people who were present. Um, Mark chapter 1, verse 29 and 31 says, And immediately he left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law, that's Peter's mother-in-law, lay ill with a fever and immediately... They told him about her, and he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and the fever left her, and she began to serve them. And then there's another miracle that happened right before the one where they took the roof off and lowered the guy down. This is in Luke chapter 5, starting in verse 12. It says, While he was in one of the cities, there came a man full of leprosy, and he saw Jesus. He fell on his face and begged him, Lord, if if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. And he charged him to tell no one but to go and show yourself to the priest and make an offering for your cleansing, as Moses commanded for a proof to them. But now even more, the report about him went abroad, and great crowds gathered to, him, to hear him and to be healed of their infirmaries. But he would, would withdraw to death, desolate places to pray. And that actually happens a lot of times throughout the Gospels as you or reading through, you'll see Jesus healed somebody, or he cast out a demon, and he told them, hey, don't tell anybody that it was me. Don't tell them how you got well. Just mind your own business. And of course, nobody ever did that. They always went and spread Jesus' name abroad everywhere. But the disciples got to see all of those times. They were there. And in fact, there's a lot of times where Jesus took just Peter, James, and John for certain healings or for certain tasks One of the things we're definitely going to look at as we look at Peter is the transfiguration, right? And it was just Jesus with Peter, James, and John. They got to see that behind the crowds, or behind the scenes away from the crowds. 
And as it says here that he would often withdraw to pray in the wilderness, that was another thing. The crowds didn't see that. The crowds didn't know that. And if they did, they would have found him. You know, when they got a chance to find Jesus alone in the wilderness, they swarmed him. But the disciples knew about that. They, they were aware. And there's another one from early in the book of Mark, Mark chapter 1, verse 35 through 39. It says, And rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him, and they found him and said to him, Everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, Let us go on to the next towns, that I may preach there also. For that is why I came out. And he went throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. So, the disciples saw the public Jesus, and they saw the private Jesus. And I think one of the, the biggest takeaways from that is that they saw that Jesus was the same in both cases. He cared just as much about the lone leper on the road as he did about the guy who got lowered down from the ceiling and everybody saw it. He loved those people. He cared for them. And it wasn't just a show. It was all sincere. Jesus cared about them very much. So I think all of that is important, especially for them to see all of that and kind of learn from that, because the third method that Jesus used was that he was going to make them a part of what he was doing. So if you'll turn with me to to Matthew, if you go to chapter 10, you'll be in a good spot because we're going to start at the end of chapter 9, and we're going to read a little bit and park here for a little bit, because this is where Jesus gives them a role in what he was doing. So Matthew chapter 9, starting in verse 35. It says, And Jesus went throughout all the cities and the villages, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the, the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. And he called to his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. The names of the twelve apostles are these. First, Simon, who he called Peter, and Andrew his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out, instructing them, Go nowhere among the Gentiles, and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and proclaim as you go, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons. You received without pay, give without pay. And of course it goes on from there. There's more instructions for them. Um, he talks about the methods that, that they need to use. And, of course, it continues even into warnings about the sort of reaction that they're going to get from people, which I think apply to us still today of, hey, watch out, because people aren't going to be happy necessarily, but stay faithful to the end. But what's interesting about these instructions is you look at the, what the disciples were tasked to go out and do and the things that they were going to say was exactly the same things that Jesus was doing and saying. In fact, even as we started in, in chapter 9, we see the motivation behind their, their calling, their motivation behind the task that they were given, is because they had the same love for the people that Jesus did. You know, they, Jesus sees the crowd, he has compassion, he says they're like sheep without a shepherd, and he says to his disciples, hey, pray that God would send out laborers into the field, because there's work to do. And they must have done that because the next thing we see is that Jesus is sending them out as laborers into the field. It was the love of Jesus that motivated them. And they preached the, me- the message of Jesus. The words, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Those are the same things that Jesus said when he first began his ministry in the book of Matthew. And of course, they did the same work as Jesus. We talked about, or he read um, his instructions there, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, and cast out demons. That's what Jesus was doing. So everything they did was in imitation of what they saw Jesus doing. And of course, I mean, in my opinion, at least hands-on is the best way to learn. 
I don't really learn anything until I have to do it. I can read about it. I can watch YouTube videos. But until I start doing it, it doesn't make any sense to me. It's, it's a hands-on, um, hands-on process. So Jesus didn't want them just to understand all of these things in theory. He wanted them to understand it in practice. Here's hands-on. You're, you have a role now in, in everything that Jesus was doing. And that's good for them, I think, because after Jesus' death and resurrection, that was their there was not Jesus here doing that anymore. It was their work. They took on the job of building the church, spreading the gospel, healing the sick, all of the rest. They did what Jesus did. And when you look at this general discipling of the 12 men who built the church, you see that Jesus started this chain of discipleship that extends all the way to where we are now. All the way down the line, through history, Jesus 12 trained those 12 men. He discipled them, and they went out and made more disciples through the Great Commission. And those men made disciples all the way down to us. All of us are here because, to some extent or another, somebody discipled us. Somebody trained us. Somebody called us. Somebody brought us to Jesus the way that Andrew brought, brought Peter to Jesus. <clears throat> and the same methods that Jesus used... I think back in my own life, that's what Jeff Alloways did with me. He used the same methods. And I was saved. I was a Christian, and I got hired to be a janitor over at the other church. Jeff was my boss. He was a pastor there. And there was a lot of times where I'd be out scrubbing floors or toilets or vacuuming the floor. And Jeff would come find me and say, hey, I've got somebody who's in trouble. I'm going to go help him out, and you're coming with me. Why would the pastor need the janitor's help. He didn't. He didn't need my help. But he brought me along so I could see how it was done, so I could learn, you know, just by watching. And then he could call me and say, hey, somebody's in trouble. You're going to go take care of them. He gave me a task, right? He gave me a part. So I guess that's always been sort of my ideal also. I take guys with me to the grocery store, and they think I'm shoplifting, Maybe it's less effective as time goes on, but I don't think so, right? And it's just life, right? I'm, you're going to come along with me and do life, and we're going to see how it goes. So as these men are progressing in their discipleship, this moment is the moment that everything changes because they go from disciple to a disciple who is also an apostle, an apostle literally translates into one who's sent out. Jesus sent them out on a mission. They, they're sent out on a job to do. But that's kind of going to be disciples of part two, I guess, as we continue on. But right as this change is taking place, right here, we get kind of a behind-the-scenes look um, at all of those methods m- mashed together, and we see how all of that really is applied in the life of Peter. So as they are coming back from their mission, Jesus receives them. And this is um, Mark chapter 6, starting in verse 30 and through 32. It says, The apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, Come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away into the boat to a desolate place by themselves. So after all that public ministry that they had done, Jesus said, hey, you guys need to come away for a little while. You need a break. Get away from the crowds. We're going to go to a desolate place for some peace and quiet. However, they had underestimated the determination of the crowd because the crowd saw them leave. They figured out where they're going, and they raced around the lake and met them on the other side. Matthew chapter 14. In fact, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 14. Um, through the the rest of the the Bible study here now. Um, 14, verse 14, it says, And when he went ashore, he saw the great crowd, that's Jesus, and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. So the disciples thought that they were getting a day off, right? They had gone out on their mission. They'd done all this work. They had replicated what they had seen in Jesus' life. And then Jesus says, Hey, it's time for 
some quiet time, all right? Let's get on the boat. Let's get out of here. Didn't happen, all right? They showed up on the other side of the lake. There's all these crowds. They probably hoped or expected that Jesus might send them away, but Jesus engaged with the crowd so as he always did. He had compassion on them. He went out and healed them. And, you know, the disciples probably weren't happy about that, but they tolerated it. You know, what are you going to do? Tell Jesus to stop helping people? Eventually, they come to him and say, hey, Jesus, it's getting late. Um, these people need to go home so they can eat. It's time to send them away. And then Jesus gives him another task. He says, no, you feed them. Verses uh, Matthew 14, starting in verse 15. It says, now when it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, this is a desolate place, and the day is now over. Send the crowds away to go into the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, they need not go away. You give them something to eat. They said to him, we have only five loaves here and two fish. But he said, bring them here to me. And he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass and taking the five loaves and the two fish. He looked up into heaven and said a blessing. Then he broke the loaves and gave them the, to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds, and they all ate and were satisfied, and they took up twelve baskets full of the broken pieces left over. And those who ate were about five thousand men, besides women and children. Jesus did not need their help to pass out bread. You know, you read through the Old Testament, and you see that God fed the whole tribe of Israel for 40 years without Peter and John passing out bread. He just manna fell down from heaven. You need bread? Boom, here it is, right in your front door. Jesus didn't need their help, but the disciples still needed to learn. The disciples still had things that they were going to be processing and learning, and so Jesus gave them another task. So they saw Jesus work with the crowd just like they had before, they, gave, they had a task that Jesus gave to them, just like they had before. And there's this incredible miracle that they get to be a part of. In fact, when we looked at uh, the, the I Am statements of Jesus through the book of John, the crowd was so blown away by this miracle that they tried to crown Jesus king right here. As like, hey, you can give us free bread. Awesome. Do this forever. Be our king. Um, but the disciples didn't get to kind of bask in that glory. Jesus didn't want them to even be around that sort of adoration. He said, you guys need to get out of here. Verse 22, immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. So this is a pretty rough day. I mean, in my opinion, I would not like this day at all. You know, they are disappointed because they don't get Jesus' attention. The crowd comes over and just sucks it all up. They get to be a part of this miracle, but they don't get to sort of receive the praise of the miracle. They, not, their, not their miracle anyway. And then instead of getting a chance even to like rest when all that's over, hey, you need to go get in a boat and row, which is not, uh, not easy, right? So they, they watched Jesus publicly minister. They had their task um, that he gave them, and then rather than any kind of quiet time with Jesus, they get to go row in a boat. Now, I've been reading this story for like 30 years as a believer, and all this time I've thought, man, they got cheated out of that quiet day. They got cheated from this promise that Jesus had made them of, hey, come away to a quiet place with me. But you know what? I never realized before that Jesus delivered. They got their quiet time on a boat. You know where it's really hard for the crowds to, to bother you? In a lake. They can't get to you out there. And if you've got stuff that mentally you're stressed out or you've had a long day and you just need to like process it all, hey, monotonous, difficult physical labor is a pretty good way to process all that. And so they got their quiet time, just not in a way that they thought they were going to. And the other thing about it is they're there in the lake, and we're going to read in a second, they had Jesus' undivided attention. Check this out, verse 14, or sorry, chapter 14, verse 23. 
It says, And after he dismissed the crowds, he went up onto the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was a long way off from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And then the fourth night, or sorry, in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. So Jesus sent the crowds away, and then he went up on the mountain to pray by himself. Who do you think he was praying for? He was praying for his disciples as they were trying to learn to apply all of the lessons that he'd been training them. And I don't really think that they were all that happy about their desolate place that Jesus has given them. They, they weren't really excited to be out there rowing on a boat. Um, you know, that's what they needed, though. They had learned this lesson of dependence upon Jesus as he gave them this task to pass out bread to 5,000 people. How do you do that? How do you multiply five loaves into 12 baskets of leftovers? Well, it's only through dependence upon Jesus. And now they're in this boat for hours upon hours, rowing and rowing and rowing. It's dark. Jesus isn't here with us. What are we going to do? They have this chance now to apply the lessons of depend upon Jesus, depend upon Jesus. And then at this, a last straw, all of a sudden there's ghosts in the water, and that's terrifying. So <clears throat> they, they were supposed to be learning and applying this lesson of complete dependence upon Jesus. <clears throat> Verse 27. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. So here at last we get to focus in on Peter. And I think a lot of times we sort of miss this moment of Peter's life because we always get to the part where he sank in the water and we think about how, his, how he failed. And we're going to look at that, but when Jesus showed up walking on the water and the disciples were terrified, Jesus said, hey, do, do not be afraid. Peter's the only one who listened to that. Peter's the only one who took heart and said, okay, well, if it's you, then let me be like you. Let me do the things that you're doing. And so he said, okay, come out, Peter, and Peter walked on the water. Not only does this demonstrate, like, that he actually listened, don't be afraid, he had courage, he had faith, but it also shows that Peter was, he understood the assignment. He was figuring out that discipleship means I'm going to become like Jesus, I'm going to do the things that Jesus did, and the way that I'm going to do that is through dependence upon him. He understood what was going on. He understood what he was supposed to be doing. But of course, we know that Peter was still in the process. He wasn't perfect. Verse 30. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying, O you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. So, the lesson of Peter here as he got out of the boat, depending on Jesus, and then got his eyes off of Jesus, fell in the water, is that the way that we're going to continue on, the way that we're going to pro progress, sorry, in our discipleship is to keep our eyes on Jesus. And that means look to him and depend upon him. And that's been the lesson all the way through their discipleship. You know, how did they pass out those 5,000 meals through dependent upon Jesus? How did they fulfill this task that he gave them as going around and preaching and raising the dead, healing the sick? Well, depending upon Jesus. How did he get out of the boat? By depending upon Jesus. And that's what we mean when we say, keep your eyes on him. Don't take your eyes off of him because that, that's the way that we're going to learn. That's the way that we're going to keep discipling. And that's the way that we're going to make more disciples, as he has, he has told us to. So it's all about Jesus. 
So now we're going to take communion together. Hopefully you guys grabbed your little cups and um, crackers. I have not yet considered that I have a mask on. I'm going to have to figure out. It's multi-layered here, but communion itself is a physical demonstration that we depend upon Jesus, right? This is our only salvation, is our connection to Jesus' death. It's not something that we could manufacture on our own. It's not some way that we can, you know, meet Jesus halfway with our salvation. He did it all. So we take the, the bread that represents his body broken for us. We drink the, the juice that rec- represents his blood poured out. And that's our only salvation. That's the only way that we could go to heaven. So let's uh, tear into these things and take communion. Well, praise God for that. Thanks. Um, Let us uh, pray, and then we're going to sing one more song. Lord, we thank you for the lessons that you uh, detailed throughout your word, that you made sure that this record was preserved for us, that we could learn from uh, the way that your disciples learned. Lord, we pray that you would help us to have the same humility that they needed to have to learn from you and, and the same boldness that, that they needed to, uh, to apply what you had to say to them and the things that you taught them. Lord, help us to be like Peter, that he would um, even have the boldness to ask you, command me to come out on the water. And Lord, when we lose sight of of you when we take our eyes off of you and get them on the wind and the waves, Lord, we pray that you would help us to remember to call out because you always answer. You always lift us up and you always put us back on, on dry ground so that we can go, go forward again. Lord, we want to be more and more like you every day. Lord, make us into uh, your people. Make us into your representatives here on earth and uh, be glorified through all that we say and do. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's stand for one last song.
so forever I am thankful for the scars. I can see, I can see. All right, guys. God bless your week. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, please remember to keep Jeff and Lori in prayer, as well as all the other folks that we know that we're praying for, the Williams family and um, Bob Walsh. We're praying for all of those folks. So God bless you guys. Thank you. Yes, we are stacking chairs. Thanks. I knew there was something else I was forgetting. I thought if I just keep rambling, maybe it'll come back to me. <laughs>